Um, welcome everyone to the CIR talk series, the third iteration uh, of the seminar. Uh, we started this in September 2020. And uh, Mustafa is going to be our first speaker this year. We have about, I don't know, 15 people in person here and about 22 online. Um, so we can get us started. Um, please let me introduce uh, Mustafa. Uh, he's a very good friend of mine. Uh, we've been lab mates uh, during uh, our master's program. So we've been friends since then. And he has done some amazing um, research in the past few years. Um, he uh, got his PhD from University of Amsterdam uh, with Job Camps and Martin Derage. And uh, he joined Google Brain. Uh, right after that, um, he has done some IR work and more recently moved to uh, more like machine learning and neural network research. Uh, his uh, current projects are related to scaling neural networks for language, vision, and robotics. And uh, his talk is also mostly related to that. Uh, the title is Universal Models for Language and Beyond. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Mustafa to go ahead. All right, uh, awesome. Th thanks for, for the introduction, Hamid. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me. This is, this is amazing to, to be able to share a little bit of uh, things that we are doing and also some of my thoughts and, uh, and uh, uh, hope, hope to uh, also catch up with you and, and hear about uh, some of your works and, and related research that you're doing. And uh, today I, I want to talk about universal models for language and uh, a little bit like computer vision and uh, also um, signal processing. And uh, um, the reason that I want to focus a bit more on language is because I think like uh, CIR, uh, like many of you are working on, on um, IR, NLP, so maybe that part is a bit more relevant, but um, I'm sure that there are people that they're interested in multimodal and uh, also going uh, Toward a little bit of you know bringing the, 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 the computer vision to the Ensemble. And I'm sure that there are so many interesting stuff. Uh, so hopefully uh, what I'm sharing would be helpful in that sense. All right, so uh, let me start with the uh, motivation that uh, as, as we know that like human brain is like really amazing. And, and this is like by far the most impressive computer, computing device that, that we know. And uh, a funny fact is that um, actually brain speed is not really good compared to the microprocessor that we have. So it's actually pretty slow compared to, uh, compared to something like you know, GPU, CPU, or TPUs. But, uh, but it's still, it's pretty impressive in terms of you know, computational power and th things that we can do uh, as a human. And this power and, and the magic comes from basically a few things. One of them is that there is massive parallelization. So uh, we can actually have billions of calculations per second done in parallel. And another thing that, that, I, uh, that I think it, it's a key, and, and I really think that uh, probably at some point we need to, to think about this a bit more. And I, I'm not sure if we can actually solve this by working on the software. But human brain is extremely power efficient. So in the morning, you take a bowl of cereal, and then you just do amazing work. And uh, if, if we want to train or, or you know, have a supercomputer doing some of these works, probably we need to spend uh, like, you know, the, the power for keeping a city working on it. And, and uh, this is just not comparable at all. And, and another important fact about human brain is that basically, there is a single set of computational units that, that we actually use for solving our problems. And I, I know that there is a sparse computation, so we are not using all of them uh, at the same time for, for every problem. Uh, we also have this lifelong long learning, so uh, we, we are basically getting them trained in a, in a really long span of time. And uh, we also have something that is also a, a bit different compared to the current neural network that uh, basically the compu computational units in, in our brain is, uh, uh, they're not the same, uh, with the same type. So neurons are, uh, are, are different in terms of type. So the, the, the ability is different. And, and all of these together make this like human brain amazing. 
And again, back to the single set of computational unit, um, uh, I think like at the end of the day, there is this limited number of uh, neurons that, that is operating to do uh, whatever we want to do and, and solve any problem that we want to solve. So uh, I want to also go back to an, another, another discussion that basically uh, we're making progress in, in many dimensions in, in you know, making like NLP better solving you know, like NLP task. So basically if, if you consider a, uh, you know, like the, 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 the problems in, in NLP as a fitness surface, we are optimizing uh, to, to get better uh, solutions for, for problems in NLP. And we do the same for computer vision uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, like reinforcement learning and, and all the other things that uh, basically we are uh, solving. And one might say that, okay, you know, this is, this is amazing. So we, uh, we are basically making progress and optimizing the different dimensions of, uh, of uh, all, the, all the problems in the world. So um, basically we are optimizing for the grand goal of AI. And, and I, I hate to use this word, but let's say, let's call it that, that spot like AGI. Uh, and and um, please take this for granted. But, but uh, let's, let's say that right now we're targeting AGI by uh, mostly optimizing for different, different dimensions. Uh, but this is not necessarily the case. So if you think about the, uh, again, the, the fitness surface of, uh, of all the problems in the world, if you make progress in one dimension independent of other, uh, other dimensions, this, this doesn't necessarily get you, putting all together, this doesn't necessarily get you to a optimal uh, solution. So it might push you to, uh, to some sort of, you know, like minimal, um, minimum that is not optimal, it's like suboptimal, but, but there's no guarantee to, to, uh, to get there. So this is a really easy, uh, like simple argument for uh, why we should not uh, just keep solving all these problems independently and why we should think about at some point, you know, uh, just merging them, um, why we need to go through the challenge and pain of actually setting up something that basically has multiple of these dimensions together and then basically just trying to optimize there and, and find a solution for that. Uh, so universal models uh, or universal solutions, let's say, uh, this, is, this is something that, that I would say is um, like uh, a direction that we might want to go to toward uh, if we want to basically make that AGI happen. And, uh, and it means that we need to shift from domain specific models and solutions to, to something that works for all the tasks, that, that works for all modalities, works for all languages. And, uh, and then we've been seeing that basically uh, like effort in that direction has been already successful and we are making a lot of progress and, and making a lot of impact. So it's already working to some extent and we're getting even sort of uh, by putting these dimensions together on, on each of these individual dimensions. Uh, and there are challenges. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about like super simple technical challenges. There are many, many philosophical challenges as well, and I don't want to get there. But uh, if, if we just look at the, 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 the issues from, uh, again, technical and like, you know, uh, I don't know if I should call it scientific, but things that are a, a bit like simple, uh, this, this the issue that, okay, what, what type of architecture we should use for, for this uh, unified or, or universal models? And uh, what, what would be the task and API uh, if you want to actually go toward unification, right? So um, like NLP, computer vision, these are all different types of inputs. One is on the pixel space, one is on the like word space, the other one is, you know, something different. So this, this is not easy to set up an API that works for, uh, for different task in applications. And, and the last one is that, how do we deal with training? So what would be the, the optimal training strategy to maximize the benefit of having all these dimensions put together and minimize the, the negative transfer? So we don't want to basically hurt uh, uh, the, the performance of the, like, you know, uh, the, the process of finding the optimal solution in one dimension by optimizing uh, uh, the, the solution on, on other dimension. So that's that's actually a, a uh, not an easy easy thing to to achieve. Uh, there are many many 
uh, related work already done on multimodal and multitask solutions. Uh, I, I, this is already outdated. There are many, many new stuff uh, like Wilbert, uh, Dolly, Clip, uh, Vat. So uh, if, if you just search for it, you, you, you can find like so many awesome research works that are super impressive. And, uh, and they, they all basically follow the same or similar structure. So they somehow find a way to have uh, rather a, a same backbone or, or sometimes like, you know, multiple backbones that, that we can call them as encoder. And they have uh, one part of the model, like the bottom part, like the stem of the model that, that is supposed to deal with, uh, uh, with tokenizing or, or somehow converting the, the, uh, the input to something that is digestible by the encoder. And the, 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 the pop top part, the head of the model is something that, that is just designed with respect to the task that we want to solve. And it, it just, you know, you, you can somehow find a way to um, like connect one input to a specific output. For example, this is just, you know, machine translation. So we have a, we kind of take the input go through the path of uh, like, you know, converting words in, in this like source language to something that is digestible by the, the body. And then we just go through the, the head that, that actually gives us uh, like words in, in the target language. And then uh, we can actually go from like, you know, image to, you know, this is like the, the detection task. So we have an image and then uh, we want to detect the objects and stuff. Uh, and there are many, many challenges. Uh, and uh, also, uh, there, there are also many considerations that, that we need to, to, uh, to be aware of. You know, um, like one, one of them is that basically uh, we, we need to find a way to balance the objectives. And, and again, uh, we don't want to make our model capable of doing something amazing, but not great at the other one. And, uh, and, um, and, and the other thing is that how much of the capacity of the model is going to be dedicated to, to one task and, and not the others? And how, how much of these capacities are actually shared across modalities and stuff? Uh, one thing that I wanted to, to say is that we used to have this situation where, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the architectural uh, and, and model unification. And, and I just stole this slide from a, a tutorial that Lukas Bayer shared, a colleague of mine shared at, uh, at, in Twitter yesterday. You can also ask him that, like, is it okay if I just take it and then I just take it at the end? And uh, uh, so we have, uh, so this slide shows a bunch of these, like, you know, areas of research and uh, shows the state of uh, like working and, and you know, the, the, the basically the off the shelf models in, 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 in those uh, like areas a few years ago. So for computer vision, we had these convolutions like ResNet. For natural language processing, we had this like concurrent neural network. Uh, for speech, it was like this split net and translation with sequence to sequence and, and, and so on and so forth. And right now we're converging to all transformers, which is which is a good thing, you know. I mean, I, I think it's somehow uh, taking a, a rather nice step toward uh, having a single model that is capable of doing uh, multiple tasks and multiple modalities, and uh, and it makes everything much much easier simply because we're not supposed to deal with multiple different technologies, and uh, we th there is a way to basically at least have some part of the architecture. Um, fixed and, and working for everything, you know, or, or consider it that, that uh, this is something that has the potential for, for solving multiple modalities and tasks. So, uh, like, so one idea is that, okay, you know, maybe we can just have modality specific tokenizer. So we just convert any, any type of input to a sequence of tokens. It's a video, it's an image, it's a, um, you know, a, a math problem, it's, it's like a natural language or whatever. We just convert it to a sequence of tokens. And these tokens are not um, something like, you know, strange, they're just like, you know, it, the vectors of size 128, you know, flow of digits, the numbers. Uh, and, and then we have a transformer encoder, which is basically in charge of contextualizing the representation of these tokens. And then we had a task specific head. And, uh, and, and the question is that, okay, you know, this is, this is nice, but can we maybe somehow find a way to have a single head or not? And uh, this, this is not easy. And there are many research that they really tried to, to unify the API and the task. So they wanted to get rid of um, the part that is 
only related or, or there, a set of parameters that is only uh, related to a single task and has nothing to do with other tasks. So one of these attempts is basically this like sequence to sequence model and T5 uh, and, and it later uh, graduated to, to T0 or X T5 that basically say that let's formulate everything as a uh, input output and uh, like as, as a set, set of um, tokens or, or sequence and then everything becomes just you know sequence to sequence model and then it's, it's a classification we just decode the class it's a scoring function or just regression we just decode some token and then take the probability of decoding that token as the as the score for, for the input so th there are many many things that they actually try to define and then they reduced many many different uh, natural language tasks into just sequence to sequence model there's also this uh, uh, this new work from, from, um, from our team, uh, UVIM, which is basically done on the region side. And what they do is that they say that, okay, you know, any, any things that you want to do on the output, you want to do classification, you want to do, um, you know, um, uh, like some sort of localization task, like segmentation or panoptic segmentation or, or you know, object detection, you just find a way to represent that outcome as a sequence of uh, digits, which is basically a guiding code. And then your model is supposed to generate that. And then you also have a way to take these uh, sequence of you know, code and then convert it to, to the output that you need. So basically it's so like a visual representation of the output is gonna be converted to a, 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 a guiding code. And then you just deal with that. And uh, it's a, a bit similar to, to the, like, you know, the, the idea of T5, but on the, on the region side. Uh, and the last thing that is, uh, is a bit complicated is that, okay, you know, how do we do then training uh, uh, in, in a way that, it, that is working for, for every, all these tasks and applications? So I want to talk about uh, one, of the, uh, one of our recent papers, uh, uh, which is on unifying language learning paradigms. Uh, I think it's a, it's a like, I don't want to talk highly about like you know our paper, but it's a decent work, so I, I really recommend it. Uh, I have also papers that I don't recommend reading them, so just to be fair. Uh, uh, but this this one is actually a really nice one, simply because we spent a ton of time uh, on a problem and work on a solution that, that didn't work for such a long time, and then we we ended up actually solving the problem by fixing something completely different. So. Uh, when we started with this project, we had this issue that why there is a T5, which has encoder decoder style, and there is GPT-3, which is encoder decoder only model. And then T5 is amazing for discriminative tasks. So, so you can just do great classification tasks and like in, in a, uh, basically can do classification tasks with like great, like really good scores, like something like superglue. And then uh, GPT-3 is actually amazing in you know, generation. And, and you know, uh, although like T5 also has a decoder, but it's not, not great. And uh, also there are a few other, other things like you know, few shot scores or, or uh, few shot abilities where we're different. And then started attributing this to the architecture. So I, I remember that we had like lots of meetings just thinking about it, can we maybe invent an architecture that is somehow between encoder, decoder, and decoder? And then we had like so many crazy ideas and like weird things that uh, that I would say it was just completely necessary. And then we ended up just understanding that basically the architecture is contributing to this difference somehow minimally. And what matters for for this final ability of the model for generation or, or you know classification is actually the, uh, the, the objective function that the model was exposed to during pre-training. So I, I'm not sure if, I, I hope that everyone is um, familiar with causal language modeling. So causal language model means that um, you, you're just predicting the next word given all the previous word, words. Prefix language modeling like or prefix LM is similar to the causal language modeling, but uh, for some part of the input, you have bidirectional attention. So it's not masked uh, and for, for the, uh, the, the target, you, you do causal language modeling. So it's like basically um, BERT plus uh, causal language modeling. And the span corruption is just, you know, predicting the, the, the part that is masked out. And, uh, and we, we wanted to know that if we can actually 
uh, somehow, and, and we realized that basically decoder models, they always train because of language modeling. And encoder decoder models, they always train with span corruption. So what we were like attributing to the architecture it was simply because of these, these objective function. And, uh, and then we ended up just simply like implementing this idea of mix and making a mixture of these denoisers, making a mixture of uh, these objective functions, and then basically train the model with, uh, with uh, all of these together. And then suddenly we realized that basically uh, the model becomes just much, much better uh, in, in uh, like aggregated scores over, over all these tasks. You know, there's, there's this plot here on, on, on the right. So in the X axis, basically, you know, uh, summarization, one chart gem, and, and on the on the y axis we have like super blue scores. So we can somehow say that you know generative on the x-axis, discriminative on the y-axis. And then you can see that for example, T5 is, is great on, on you know discriminative tasks, but not great in generation. And you know, GPT or you know, or some decoder, decoder models like UniLM or prefix LM, they're much better. And then uh, if, if we actually use UL2, it becomes better at, at like, you know, both directions. And so two dimensions at the same time are becoming, uh, you know, like we, we get improvement on two dimensions. And if I want to just quickly give you a little bit of uh, details about the mixture of denoisers. So, uh, so basically we have three denoisers and uh, we call them R denoiser, like a regular denoiser, and then S denoiser and X denoiser. So R denoiser is just simply span corruption, the way that T5 solved it. And, and S denoiser is prefix LM, which is uh, like, you know, combination of span corruption with causal LM. And X denoiser was somehow an extreme version of the span corruption that we wanted to uh, expose the model to situations where this corrupt, cor like the, the, the recovering the corrupted part is uh, done, should be done in an extreme way. So in span corruption, for example, you say that I, I have a sentence of 100, words and then I, uh, I work with tokens and, and I mask out, uh, you know, three parts. And the first one has three words. The, the second part has like two words and the last one is like, you know, three words. And then, uh, we, so basically you, you have two, two different knobs. One is how many spans do you want to recover? And the other one is that, what is the length of these spans that you're supposed to recover? And then the X denoiser is basically um, going extreme on these knobs. So we had a situation where we asked the model to just recover like suddenly 70% of the sentence and we just mask out that. Or we just asked the model to, to recover, you know, uh, instead of three spans, we just asked the model to recover, you know, like 20 spans of size two or three. So there, there are some extreme, um, um, like, you know, situation with, uh, with the configuration of the uh, uh, span corruption. And we have actually super cool applications on uh, what is the effect of this, how you can somehow associate um, these uh, these objective functions with some sort of behaviors that that uh, that the model uh, would uh, would would pick up. Uh, all right, I was supposed to talk about these these denoisers in this slide, but this is like you know a uh, a, a really nice diagram that I made. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, this is the, the, the regular denoiser. This is the S denoiser. So, you know, the second part is has, uh, is masked out and the X denoiser, which is basically uh, spans get longer or we have so many spans that, that we need to, to recover. And, and there's also one thing that I wanted to show you. So if, if you notice that there is also one token added to the input, which is R, S, or X. So during pre-training, we somehow give the, the model a simple hint that what type of denoising task it is, uh, it is doing. And one thing that we've done, which was super cool, that we tried adding these tokens as the prompt during fine tuning or, or during some somehow inference uh, to the model, which gives the model to a hint to, to basically switch the mode to something that is good for solving this task. And, uh, uh, and then if I, if I want to just high, like give, give a high level explanation or intuition about this is that basically we are making an association between, uh, uh, between what we need to do during fine tuning and what we, we have done during the, the pre-training. And, and this is uh, basically based on this prompting token 
uh, that somehow shifts the paradigm or let's say, you know, shifts the gear uh, in which the model that uh, model is operating. Uh, so we have a bunch of applications, so many cool results. And, and one of the good things about this is that it's actually open source. Uh, and, and, and we also release a model. So I think, like, I think it's one of the biggest models that, that Google ever released. So it's like a 20 billion parameter. Uh, uh, which is basically uh, compute uh, equivalent to a 10 billion decoder only. Uh, and, uh, and it will outperform GPT-3. Uh, it's actually pretty nice. Uh, uh, it's like three times performance of T5XXL and, and, and there are a bunch of cool results that you can actually uh, check out. We're updating the paper with lots of cool results about chain of thought um, reasoning and, and uh, so if, if you just hold on in you know, a few days, you're gonna see an, another version of the paper that has even, even uh, better results on, on different tasks. Uh, all right, I'm gonna just jump. Uh, I'm not gonna go to, to detailed results, a bit boring. And as I said, we have the, the model release. It's already in hugging phase. So if you're working with hugging phase, you can just simply just uh, load the model and then use it. And, and the second one, the second paper that I wanted to talk about is basically, and uh, DSI, which I, I think it's a bit more relevant uh, for, for many of you because it's somehow an idea uh, with respect to the, uh, the like, you know, IR application. And the whole idea is that can we use a transformer to memorize uh, the, the, the whole corpus and somehow given a query, just ask the transformer to just give us the document ID. So it's basically uh, just instead of having an index and, and a ranking function and everything, you just, just replace it with a single transformer. And then um, you try to memorize all these, uh, the content of all these documents. And then um, what you do is that at inference time, you just send a query in, you get a document ID out, or you can also find a way to, you know, get a list of documents IDs um, out, you know, using, for example, beam search. So uh, the idea is extremely simple. It was actually a bit surprising that it worked. Uh, a disclaimer is that it's still, there are like many, many things to, to be explored in that direction. And, and it's just, you know, a, uh, I would say a, an initial work uh, on, on something that was, uh, that is pretty cool, but, uh, but yet there, there, there are a lot, uh, there, there's a lot room for, for improvement in, in many directions. I can talk about a few of those uh, at the end. But, but the whole idea is that I have a transformer encoder decoder sequence to sequence model, let's say. Uh, during pre-training, I have uh, all these documents. I just assign them some random ID, like, you know, like the first one is 0001, second one is 002, just randomly. I, I don't care about the, um, the how do these documents are, are related or if IDs that are similar, uh, you know, uh, that they're supposed to also be assigned to similar documents or not. So just let's let think about the, the, the random way of doing this. We actually have ideas to you know, make, make it a bit more meaningful, but a simple case is just randomly assign IDs. And then during pre-training is that, okay, you know, just uh, it's completely unsupervised, feed the document, just uh, try to decode the, the document ID, either by decoding digit by digit, or let's say we just want to decode it as a single token. And during inference, uh, like, you know, retrieval tag, task, we basically just send a query and then just get the document ID. So the closest, uh, it, it just gives us somehow the document that is relevant to that query. And, uh, and again, there are many, many things that we've done. So this is like vanilla idea, but many things that we've done, like uh, how do you get a list of documents given a query or uh, how do you basically make these document IDs a bit more meaningful? And there are many also follow-up uh, ideas that should be explored. One of them is that, uh, you know, uh, what if we go to a larger corpus? You know, what if we want to do this on MS Marco? You know, it's like there are much more documents. Can we really memorize the whole thing? You know, the, we, we tried it on a smaller data sets uh, to just showcase that this is to some extent working. But the, the, the biggest question is that, can you really do that for the whole web or not? You know, and and uh, of course this is this is a, a great question, but uh, but in general I, I think this 
this direction uh, would, would be nice to, to be explored simply because it just gives you a, uh, a model that you can uh, like, you know, train it end to end. And then you can also plug it in, into something that, that you want to train it end to end uh, without having this multi-stage indexing and retrieval function. So it's, it all becomes just, you know, transformer training. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit about also uh, like uh, uh, the, the computer vision side of transformers and uh, starting from vision transformer, which uh, probably most of you know about this. But uh, when we started working on, uh, on vision transformer, we actually had a tough time just getting transformer work on, on, on just simple task of image recognition or image classification. And uh, we started from sending a, a sequence of pixels to the transformer encoder and sequence was like super long. And then we never got a transformer actually learning something from sequence of pixels. And then we started actually sending a sequence of patches. And, and by patches, I mean, you know, just like non overlapping part of the image. And then, you know, just simply you divide it into uh, three by three patches and then you make a sequence and then send it. Uh, and then it didn't work out. And then we trained it on a much, much, much larger data set and then suddenly started working. And then that was, that was really nice, simply because um, at that time, we, we realized that basically uh, we've been working on a data set like ImageNet or, or CIFAR, which, which is not really big enough to, to be able to train a model that we don't have uh, like vision inductive biases encoded inherently in the architecture of the model. So, so convolutions, they already have lots of properties like you know uh, translation invariance and, and lots of things that that basically contribute to the uh, to the performance of the model by encoding uh, some you know prior knowledge or you know information that that is needed for uh, for processing images but transformers they don't have those so we need to show them like a lot of data to be able to just somehow let them pick up some of the features and uh, and later people have done like lots of work to basically do, you know, like enable transformer to also do a good job on, on smaller data sets. Like, you know, they, they've done crazy amount of fragmentation and, and figurization, or they added, you know, convolution um, parts that, that somehow brings that inductive bias to the model. But, but the vanilla transformer that operates on patches as a sequence of tokens, it, it really needed lots of data to be able to pick, up, to pick that up. But when you think about the scaling, we, we realized that basically transformer is much, much better than larger scale. So if you really want to train a model on that amount of data and you go to that scale, vision transformer was much, much more efficient compared to like something like ResNet 101. And then, um, and then, and then that was the start of basically uh, thinking about that maybe this is this is a nice direction to, first of all, move to our uh, a, a, a architecture and that, that has been explored on language side for, for many years. Uh, just, you know, we can just pick up uh, lots of, of the shelf ideas and, and techniques uh, and, and we don't need to, to think about it from scratch. And, uh, and it's also a one step toward like, you know, unifying things and, and then uh, and, 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 and also we, we noticed that the computer vision uh, community also picked that up and, and uh, just basically just transformers are taking over that field uh, by storm. Uh, so one of the things that we actually work on later is just polyvit, which is a little bit of, uh, you know, unification on images, videos, and audio. So what we do is exactly what I, uh, described in, in that slide that I had a stem, an encoder, and task-specific heads. So this is, we have a stem, which is basically tokenizer for different modalities. We have image tokenizer, which is just patching. We have video tokenizer, which is basically 3D patching, and audio tokenizer, which is uh, working on a spectrogram. And then it's basically also taking different part of the audio as tokens. And, and then we have single encoder, which receives a sequence of tokens, no matter what is, uh, what is this, what, what are these tokens? Is it like images or, or uh, uh, is this like coming from video or, uh, or audio? And then we have a few layers of transformer and then we send it to the head that is responsible for the task. So, you know, for example, the first one is 
you know, classification task on images. The second one is detection on images. For example, the last one is classification on audio. So this was super simple. And uh, um, basically, the, uh, the, the, the cool things about this is that we, we had to find a recipe that, uh, that makes all these uh, tasks and, and modalities and applications get trained together. And then we had this co-training set up where uh, basically, sorry, we, we tried multiple ideas, you know, what, what if we just train the model task by task? What if we alternate between these? What if we do some sort of weighted sampling of the task and, you know, take batches with respect to the data sizes? And then uh, we, we had to actually go through uh, lots of different ideas to be able to find a way that the training is effective. And then at the end of the day, we noticed that basically this super cool that with a single model, we can get the performance of individual models. So uh, first of all, uh, it, it's, it's great. Um, you know, you, you no longer need individual models if you are really developing these models for something, you know, some on-device applications, you no longer need to have a model for processing images on your cell phone and one for processing videos and audio. You just have a single model that is capable of doing all these tasks and the, the, the performance is uh, um, as good and sometimes even better than, than individual models. And the other thing was basically we sometimes we actually get much better results and, and we hit so far on, uh, on video modeling, for example, simply because there is a really nice positive transfer from what we can pick up and what we can learn from images and audio on, on video side. All right, okay. I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, if this was fast or slow, but uh, we have like 20 minutes for question answering. But what I wanted to also say is that basically uh, this is something that I feel like, like lots of companies are, are basically moving toward. And, and I think university has, uh, is a, a really nice spot and position to, to basically make this happen. So I think if we want to really build a universal model, it probably requires long-term commitment to, to research and engineering by a diverse set of people. And, and I think especially for, you know, like PhD is like four years. And then um, if, if you think about that, okay, you know, this, this is long enough to, to think about building actually something in that direction. And then uh, it, it's great that you have all the expertise just sitting next to you. So you just walk out of your, your lab, go to the next lab, there's so many people doing NLP. You go to the next one, so many people doing, doing computer vision. And uh, it's already happening. Uh, and, and this is really nice to see that, you know, cross lab collaborations, but, but, uh, but this is great that, that basically uh, uh, people can, can think about like how to basically move toward this unification and how we can somehow bring the expertise from the IR community, uh, to, to the like, you know, computer vision community and then how we can basically just simply find a setup, define that setup and, and go through the pain of actually setting up a benchmark that enables us to, to measure the progress and, and work together on building something that is really uh, a good and much more effective uh, step toward uh, this like, you know, AGI. Again, I, I, when I, every time that I use this term, it's, it feels so weird. Uh, but uh, but anyhow, I think it's it's not a bad idea to to somehow have that in mind. So uh, uh, yeah, that was that was just uh, my my last slide. And uh, thank you so much. And I'm happy to take questions. All right, I actually don't see uh, you. So great, thank you, Mustafa. Let's. Uh, really enjoyed the talk. Thanks. Um, it was very exciting to see um, results from different communities and basically universal models for region, text, audio, and things like that. So I'm going to go through the questions um, probably by alternating between the virtual audience and in-person audience. Any questions from people here? Hi, Mustafa. Thank you so much for the great talk. I really enjoyed it. 
Uh, so this is Hevia. I, um, uh, I have a question uh, for the part that you talk about uh, IR. Uh, you frame IR as generation task. Um, I really uh, like your vision, but um, so my question is uh, the way that you cast the problem as generation, does the first uh, retrieve document kind of cascade some sorts of bias into the uh, following document that will be generated deeper in the list? All right, okay. So this is actually, uh, thanks for, for the question. This is actually a really good, good question and also super relevant to uh, one of the directions about like this differentiable search index or, or DSI. Uh, that I are as generation task that we never got time to explore. So if anyone is interested to look into that, just let me know. I'm super excited about this. But that's about like how how does the compositionality work here, right? So one of the things that it's a bit lame to say that, but I, but it has been a big question in my mind, but I've never got time to try it. Is like, what if I concatenate two of these documents? And then just ask the, the, the model to generate the doc ID. Which one does it generate? Does it generate the first one, second one, uh, like I don't know, like sum them up or something? So this this is somehow you know unknown. So what what I think what you're also saying is a little bit relevant to this that basically how the association of these uh, the, 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 the semantic or or even you know the like syntax of these documents is modeled underneath and how does basically encoding one document is going to impact another document? We, uh, we have a follow-up paper on this and it's gonna be out soon. I'm, I'm so scared every time that I want to talk about something this come out because they don't know how much I can share, but, but it's, it's exploring the idea of, um, can we do something with respect to uh, increasing the control on memorizing or forgetting something. So basically the biasing the process by adding the document or removing the document and then making sure that, you know, this is not going to impact what is happening on the model. It, again, it, it is kind of like, again, relevant to, to what, what you just asked, but what you just also mentioned, this, this question specifically, we don't know. And uh, this is definitely something open to to be explored, and uh, in, they're much more in, in that direction. Basically, how how what is the effect of actually adding one more document on all the existing documents, or or what if the uh, you know effect of uh, adding 10k more documents on on the first 10k documents that we encoded? So this is this is we don't we don't really have an answer for it. And and the first paper was <laughs> we didn't get really time to to explore all these aspects. Uh, and and uh, I think it deserves basically studying a bit more uh, thoroughly and, and understand what's going on. Thank you. Great, thanks. So I'll read the next question from the chat. Mm -hmm. So a question from Trank. I asked him if the question is related to the UL2 model. Uh, the question is, how do you use token to choose which mode of the noiser the model should use? Uh, we cannot hear you again. Your oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, I uh, is this about uh, which? So, okay. If I'm, I'm just trying to repeat the question. So, it's basically we train the model with uh, with different denoisers, and then every time we associate a prompting token or you know a mode token. Uh, we could we just concatenate this in, with with uh, with, uh, with the input to the input when we want to do this type of denoising. And the question is that how do you decide on which one of these to use if you want to, for example, fine tune going classification? You know, do you do you do like R? You connect R, or you just connect S? Uh, this is a great question again, and uh, and what we do is a bit hand wavy, but it works. Uh, I don't have a, you know, like a mathematical proof or really, you know, 
an answer with like super good deep understanding. But we, we realized that basically, uh, if it is about generation, like this estinoiser is really close to, to generation task, right? So if, if you want to do summarization, this mode is basically given a, a context we want to generate the rest. And, and basically, you're supposed to generate all the tokens next to each other, like, you know, basically one by one. So for generation, like, you know, S denoiser would be a nice one. And then, and then we just simply append the S token. And then we observe that this is actually working better than, than others. And for something like classification, uh, or, or sometimes actually, you know, X denoiser also works pretty, pretty decent in generation. And for something like classification, R denoiser actually works pretty good. We have a table in the, in the paper that has comparison between the performance of the model when we are appending different prompt tokens for a single task. So you can see the, uh, the, how, how this is impacting the, the performance. It's not always super significant, uh, but, but there is like, you know, we can somehow make a connection between uh, the task and the nature of this denoising uh, objective. Uh, but, but again, there, there's, there's nothing that I would say to call, you know, it's obvious that for, you know, summarization, you should use SD No, um, I think there was one, one task that I don't remember, but it was actually weird for us that why, for example, you know, this SD noiser works, why based on my intuition, like, you know, rigor denoiser should be much, much better. Uh, but yeah, about, but there's a table in the, in the paper, uh, that, that has ablation on this. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any question from the audience? Uh, I think we'll leave it this yeah. long. Uh, hello, so my name is Chris, and uh, thanks for the very nice talk. And so you talked about building universal, uh, universal model. And we as humans, the way we work is we have two types of memory. We have a temporary working memory and long-term memory. And depending on the signal we receive from the environment, like the, the things we read or we see, we decide what to store in the temporary working memory and what to store in the long-term memory. But the way transformer model, uh, transformer language models work is they, they behave more like frozen repositories of knowledge. They cannot adapt to dynamically to new types of input. They are more like fr frozen indexes of knowledge. Is there any work that tries to rethink how memory language models and how to make them more dynamic? Sure, of course, guide a transformer from your group as an example. So if I want to basically give a few examples about works that, uh, that they go to that direction is that those that they try to add a uh, retrieval augmented component, uh, uh, like, you know, like a component that basically augments the model with, with the, the power of retrieving some facts or knowledge or something, and then adds that to the ensemble for uh, to, to somehow uses that for, for basically processing the input, like, you know, guided transformer uh, from, from your group. It does basically some sort of, you know, uh, cross attention to, to the tokens that are retrieved from, from a, a bank or, or a, uh, you know, embedding and uh, retro or, or many other works that they are basically on, on the side for uh, retrieval enhanced model. Uh, there's also a super good uh, position uh, paper uh, in CIR this year that we had uh, with Hamid and, and uh, a few colleagues that actually talks about this in, in a high level and how you can somehow add this or basically give access to these transformer or, or any machine learning model in a way that uh, it has unlimited, um, you know, basically your, your like you know, the uh, you, you don't need to basically encode every everything in in your parameters. You have uh, access to something that uh, that that goes beyond memorization, and then you can simply just connect that to your model and then do do the work. In terms of adaptivity, that's actually a really good question. There are two types of adaptivity. One is with respect to the content. So sometimes I want to retrieve this part or these you know tokens to to attend to. And sometimes you think about, okay, how many, how many tokens or, or uh, you know, the amount of content that I want to bring. So just like, you know, the content or, or the amount of um, documents or items that you want to retrieve. The second one goes to the, uh, to the domain of adaptive computation, which there are works actually exploring that direction. 
Uh, we have a project um, on, on that again. Um, it's going to be out soon. Hopefully, we can, we can share more about this soon. But uh, but that's also something that you can somehow bring more information or retrieve more information, but dynamic amount of it. So not not only in terms of content, but also in terms of you know number of items that you want to bring to to the model. But retrieval augmented uh, transformers are, are great examples uh, to, to go toward that direction. And, and I agree that if we want to really go toward a uh, like, you know, universal model, scaling these models is not sustainable. And, and we really need to have some sort of you know, uh, um, retrieval component that, that bring this ability to the model that, that it can access unlimited amount of information uh, post hoc. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I made another question from the chat. Uh, the same as question which I asked him is related to the DSI model. Um, question is, how about generating the relevant documents directly without using the doc IDs as proxy? So that, that's actually a good question. So it's basically, what if I send a query in and then somehow get a document content out. Uh, of course, that would be amazing, you know, but, but it's much more challenging than generating an ID. So I think this DSI is just a step zero for what you're describing. And uh, I think this idea has been explored. I think this, this was somehow a, a really old CIR paper that I, that I really like, uh, sorry, ECIR paper that I really like, I think it was from 2015 or something, but, but someone had this idea of what if we, make a Wikipedia document just on the fly. So you just search for something and then suddenly a Wikipedia page that doesn't exist just gets generated, just renders all the images, title, information. So it's actually super cool, right? So I think like maybe we are going to that direction to have search engines that they basically put on uh, content together somehow by generating these, uh, uh, you know, some, some language, natural language and they generate document on the fly, but, but that's much, much more difficult than what, what happens in DSI. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a great idea, but, uh, but I don't think it's easy. And, and there are many, many things that, <laughs> that is still so broken for having such a model that, that can be as amazing as just retrieving a, a, an existing relevant document. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? So I, uh, I'll ask one. Um, so again, about the DSI model, uh, I think you also point out that the uh, scalability aspect of the larger collections uh, has not been studied yet. Uh, but I'm interested to know what your vision about it. So um, we have a long history of scaling up to very large collections. It's easy to represent documents, we add them to the index, whatever it says. It, um, now we are relying on model to memorize everything, and the model is stored in a GPU memory or a TPU memory. Um, so, can we envision any solution that's scalable at all to memorizing, for example, a super large collections like the web? All right. Okay. So it's again a, a, a great question, and it just shows the challenge. Uh, I would say the, the main and, and biggest challenge for getting DSI to something that is actually uh, used in, in a you know, like a real war application. And uh, there, there are multiple things that we should actually think about. Like one of them is that there is a huge amount of compression when we actually work with DSI. So you should not think about, oh, what is the size of web? So if I want to actually download web, it's gonna be like, you know, trillions of, you know, like bytes and something. but but there is actually a compression process that compresses the data and it's lossy, but, but maybe we can actually end up with doing this compression in a, in a really nice way. And then maybe we can, you know, like regardless of neural networks, maybe there, that we can find an algorithm that does the compression. Probably at, at some point, you know, there, there's, a, there's a like, you know, upper bound for, for the, uh, the amount of compression that you can do. But, uh, but it's not just, simply comparing the memory of the hardware that we have with the size of the web. So there, there is compression. But, but another one is that, do we really have the ability to do memorization? 
And I think with this type of document IDs or, or a vanilla one, no, there's no way. We were able to scale it up by thinking about uh, some you know, creative ideas of generating document IDs. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit like um, uh, on, on the side that I won't be able to share, but, but the idea is that, okay, you know, there's, we, we tried many things, you know, just the vanilla one and, and these different things that we have, but, but we ended up actually thinking completely different and, and you know, taking a drastically different approach for generating these document IDs. And then we realized that, oh, this is actually much, much, much more scalable compared to just simply taking IDs as atomic IDs or you know, a sequence of digits. Uh, so I think there, there is actually a way to move toward that direction and make it much more scalable, but, but it's not easy. And I don't think that Google will, will at some point change like and replace the whole search engine with a transformer memory anytime soon. I, I don't wanna say that it never. But not not anytime soon. But maybe for I don't know some some if, for example for personal search maybe in, if you are you know in your email maybe there is a way to do that you know maybe because the data is much lim much more limited um, and what you need to memorize is like you know um, is like probably much less and maybe you can somehow guarantee a good memorization uh, and also uh, like deliver something that that is decent enough for, for a smaller scale. Uh, but it's a good question in general. And, and I think that that is the bottleneck for getting these models uh, to, to actual, uh, to, to something like which we call it search engine. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll read the next question from the chat from Vidyar. Uh, this will be the last question in the time. So about VIT, the region transformer, how did you decide on training VIT on the much larger JFT data set, even though you knew it didn't work on the smaller data sets? Wasn't it risky? And how often do you succeed on those kinds of experiments or crazy ideas that you don't even know will work? All right, okay. So this is, this is uh, again, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but, but like there, there are a few things that we have a little bit of privilege, but uh, I think it's hard to do that in, at the university, you know, because like the compute budget is much more limited. So you cannot really think about, oh, let me just scale it up. It doesn't work on a smaller scale, maybe it works on, on larger scale. So it's, it's, it's too much of risk. But what, what we realize in, in general is that scaling, if you have compute budget is actually the safest bet. So in many situations, <laughs> something doesn't work, but just to scale it up, it works. So it's, it's not really like, it's, it's not a, uh, I don't want to say that, oh, we actually went through this brilliant process of deciding that this is an idea that worth scaling. No, I mean, uh, it, it's funny that, <laughs> that how we ended up actually just training it on JFT, but uh, we had infrastructure to do that. And then somehow this idea was developed in a code base that was a, that we were able to actually do the same things with that. And then, and then we just did it. So if this idea was like, you know, uh, was kind of implemented initially, this like, you know, small scale region transformer on ImageNet on a code base that didn't have the infrastructure for training such a large model on, on such a large amount of data, maybe this wouldn't happen. And uh, so the process was not somehow, of course, you know, I, I don't want it to also, you know, just downplay the, uh, the, the effort and, and, you know, there are like so many smart people, but I just, in general, I think, with, with the current situation, scaling is a safe bet. So in the, there are many situations that it just doesn't work and then you scale it up and then it works. You know, there, there, there's this paper, probably you've, you've seen that, there's this emergent abilities of large language models that show that there's zero performance up to some scale. And then when you go to some larger scale, suddenly something starts working, like many reasoning and math tasks. And, and, and it's actually a really nice observation. And then uh, I think it happens in many situations that uh, you scale up neural networks, suddenly they just become capable of doing something that they were not able to do that. But, uh, but that's also really depending on uh, how much compute you have and do you afford to do that or not. Okay, great, thanks. Let's thank Mustafa once again.
there is one more question in the chat, but uh, because of the time, I cannot read that. But uh, whoever asked that question, I uh, suggest you to reach out to staff. I'm sure that you will uh, be happy to respond to your questions. And again, thank you for joining us and uh, looking forward to see you in two weeks for the next year. Talk.